Welcome to the Commonwealth Matters. I'm Richard Nelson, Executive Director of CPC, and joining me on today's program is pastor, author, and speaker, Bob Russell, who pastored Southeast Christian Church in Louisville for, I believe, about 40 years. Uh, pastor Russell, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Richard. It'd be really good to be with you, and beautiful day here in Louisville, so uh, be a good day out playing golf. <laughs> yes, but, uh, well, I appreciate you. Glad to you, too. Yeah, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, to join us uh, for the Commonwealth Matters and to talk about where the culture is today, uh, some of the challenging issues, and then in particular, how pastors can respond to the issues and how churches can respond. And, and, and Bob, you're a little older than me. Uh, I'm not calling you old, but you're a little older. You've got a few more years under, under your belt. You've seen a lot in your lifetime. Um, you, in fact, you were alive during the turbulent 1960s. You graduated from college in 1965, I believe. So you, you've been through periods of cultural upheaval before. And I'm wondering if our current time, especially the last couple of years, I'm wondering how does it compare to the 1960s? Is it similar? Uh, is it different? How, how would you compare the two, two, uh, two times? In my mind, they don't compare at all. In the 1960s, there was turbulence, but there was also a great deal of steadiness in the church. And there was kind of a universal or at least a, a nationwide consensus of right and wrong. And today, there, there is no moral consensus. And the, uh, the problems seem to be uh, growing exponentially. If you would have told me uh, 50 years ago that we'd come to a time when some of the wild things that are going on are going on, I, I would have never guessed that, uh, you know, censoring Dr. Seuss and refunding the police and, and uh, going to ban Oral Roberts University from participating in the NCAA tournament. And uh, this unbelievable lack of common sense in uh, the, the culture. And we wonder what in the world happened to us. And I, I just think, you know, when the Book of Romans talks about when a culture uh, rejects God, uh, the spiral goes down rapidly. And the, the, the final phrase is thinking themselves to be wise, they became fools. Mm -hmm. And that's where I see us today. Uh, having rejected God, maybe beginning in the 60s, uh, from uh, education and from politics and from the culture in general, we have just nosedived from there morally and spiritually. And so I, I think, uh, I, I hate to sound like a doomsayer, but uh, there's no comparison where we are right now with where we are in 1960. E either God has uh, withdrawn his hand of blessing on America and is judging us, or uh, we're going to need uh, some shock to the system, maybe a spiritual revival to, to get us back in uh, where we should be. Uh, there's going to have to be some kind of shock to the system to bring us back. It, it may be war, it may be depression, but what I'm praying for is that it'll be a spiritual revival somehow that breaks out. And in order for that to happen, Christian people are going to have to step up and, and step to the fore. No, and I agree with you, uh, Bob, that uh, we need a revival. I would say, really, we need an awakening, which is broader than a revival. It's uh, the reality of God in our lives and in our culture. And Kentucky is not foreign to, to awakening. We saw it back, well, we weren't around, but back in the early 1800s, 1800, 1801, there was an awakening that started in West Kentucky, my neck of the woods, moved up to this part of the state in uh, Cane, Cane Ridge, uh, but the reality of God um, became evident in the lives of people, and it changed people's lives, and so, so you just mentioned a moment ago about us not having uh, moral consensus. Uh, I would say, and I agree with that, uh, we've lost a moral compass. We don't have a measuring stick, if you will, by which to judge right or wrong. And uh, how, how do we get to a place like that? Is, is that something maybe we've taken for granted that there is a moral compass? Uh, and how, how does a society have a moral compass? You know, was, uh, Arnold Toynbee did that study years ago, what, 22 civilizations or so he studied in history. And he said uh, 19 of them collapsed from within, that the 
culture or society would last about 200 years. And just like the nation of Israel, they would begin to uh, take for granted their blessings and become prideful. And uh, the pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And, and so it, it's, it's nothing new, really. They're, they're, instead of, you know, that'd be the second thing I would mention is about how do we get here? We get here by rejecting God. And secondly, we get here by we quit studying history. And we think, well, we're so sophisticated. History has nothing to teach us because we're so far advanced from the past. So we, we, we quit studying history in, in our educational system and we knock down the statues and we uh, denigrate the heroes. And, you know, C.S. Lewis called that intellectual uh, chronological snobbery is what he called it, chronological snobbery that, that we think we're so sophisticated and so far advanced that history has nothing to teach us. So having rejected God, not learning history, we're, we're gonna repeat the same cycle that uh, 19, 20 other civilizations in, in front of us have, have repeated. Very good. Uh, so we're seeing uh, institutions reject uh, this idea that there is a moral code or a moral compass. We're seeing influential people reject this idea. I'm going to share with you a quote from a CNN reporter recently, a very controversial quote, uh, Devin Cole, uh, who said this the other week, it's not possible to know a person's gender identity at birth, and there is no consensus criteria for assigning sex at birth. Uh, obviously a controversial statement. CNN has since walked back that statement, tried to explain it, uh, and they, they actually changed what he said on their website. But how do we get to a place, and I guess the, well, you've answered this, Bob, uh, it's by rejecting God uh, as the moral lawgiver, as the one who defines morality right from wrong. He defines male from female. But I want to pivot over to pastors. Now that's a controversial statement. Um, is that something, that statement, and, and then I guess in a broader sense to where our culture is regarding morality, is that something that pastors should respond to? Should, should a pastor in a, in a pulpit on a Sunday morning respond to something? We, we need to call sin, sin, and uh, truth, truth. That's not a controversial statement. That's a stupid statement. That's, a, that's an ignorant statement. When, when the Bible says, that uh, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put light for darkness and darkness for light. We're, we're, we've drifted so far, we've lost all common sense. And, and we, we don't know up from down and thinking ourselves to be wise, we become fools. Now, should pastors speak out about that? With, without question, because if, if people aren't learning from history and they've rejected the Bible, then the next step is, the Christian people, especially torchbearers in the church, uh, uh, the, the trumpet has got to set forth a sound so that the Christians can rally to, to, to battle. And we've got to be bolder in speaking the truth. We're, we're, we're so afraid that we're going to be labeled uh, a hater or a homophobe or a racist that we just have uh, retreated into uh, unforgivable silence. And the, the church has, uh, when you talk about mission creep, it, it's, it's existed in the church for the last several decades. We're, we're so focused on trying to gain the world's favor, to be, be well thought of by the seeker, that we've, we've changed our emphasis from evangelism to social action. And social action is good because Jesus taught us to care for the poor and to feed the hungry and clothe the naked. But we, we've forgotten about evangelism. We've forgotten about the proclamation of the gospel and calling people forth to repentance. You know, the Old Testament prophets spoke the truth to power. He, he, Elijah saw King Ahab hadn't seen him for like three and a half years and King called him, oh, there's my enemy. Elijah didn't say, oh, I've, I've offended a king. I've got to soften my message. He recognized he stood in opposition to the king. John the Baptist came on the scene and he called out King Herod for living with his brother's wife, said it's not right. It cost him his freedom, eventually cost him his head, but he took a stand for truth. And, and, and we have, uh, think about how we, we applaud Dietrich Bonhoeffer 
because he stood up and he spoke out against uh, the policies of Adolf Hitler at the cost of, he said, when God bids a man to, he, he calls a man, he calls a man to die. And, and I, I, I think that Christian leaders ha have got to become more courageous. Now, I don't mean obnoxious. Just because we speak up doesn't mean we, we're to be obnoxious. We're to speak the truth in love. And I, I think we've got to avoid this, the extreme of, uh, on the one hand, we're absolutely silent and wimpy. And on the other hand, uh, our, our church becomes a political action committee. But oh, well, I'm sorry if I could jump in. Very good points. Uh, how do you find that balance? How does a pastor find that balance from being totally silent to becoming a political apparatus for a political party? How, how do they find uh, just a way to speak to the issues without being look obnoxious or unnecessarily offensive uh, or becoming co-opted by a party. Uh, where is that balance? Well, I think the key word you're using is balance. One of my favorite descriptions of Jesus is that he was full of grace and truth. Mm -hmm. There was that perfect balance in him. He was, most of us are either truth people or we're grace people. And, but Jesus was 100% truth and 100% grace. And, and that's the, the uh, goal for those of us who lead the church, for those of us who preach the gospel, that, that it has to be done in a spirit of compassion and love. I used to have a mentor, Olin Hay, who, who said when he preached his first sermon as a young seminary student, he preached at his home church. And he said he knew these people really well. And he just lambasted them from the pulpit for every sin he could remember them committing. He said, after he was finished, he asked the preacher, B.W. Carrier, how did I do? And B.W. Carrier said, well, brother, hey, Olin, you did fine. He said, just remember, you can't preach the love of God with a clenched fist. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think we can, we can stand for truth and attract people with an angry spirit and a clenched fist. What I encourage preachers to do is to preach expository sermons, just preach through the book of, of the Bible. And you know what? Every issue that our culture faces pops up in scripture. If you've got one hand with a Bible and the other hand with a newspaper, those culture issues bubble up naturally in the teaching of the scripture. And people can't accuse you of riding a hobby horse or uh, uh, jumping on a hot button issue if you're just verse by verse going through a book of the Bible. So I think the way to stay in balance is to be full of grace and truth and just preach verse by verse through scripture, but boldly uh, stand for the truth when, when those issues come up. Now, one of the things that happens, Richard, I, I did a retreat for preachers just two weeks ago, and a young preacher said he preached through the book of Romans. And he said, I got to Romans 1 where it talks about the downward spiral of a culture and God gave them over to unnatural affections. So he said, I went on to describe what Romans said, but there were people in the, in the church who became angry with him uh, because he, he was preaching what the Bible says about homosexuality. So even though we stay balanced and even though we try to do it in love, we've got to anticipate that uh, some people are going to oppose us, that they're going to, we, we've got to develop a tough skin in a sense. Yeah, very good. If you're just joining us, you're listening to the Commonwealth Matters. I'm Richard Nelson here with Bob Russell, and we're talking about the pastor's role in their community, the pastor's role to speak to the issues. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to be back in just a minute to talk about CPC's Christianity and Culture Conference. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Commonwealth Matters. I'm Richard Nelson, Executive Director of CPC, here with Bob Russell. And Bob, you are going to participate in a Christianity and Culture Conference that we're holding in Lexington on April the 29th. And these are a series of conferences that we have put together to be held across the state to help the church think through where the culture is, uh, and, and then how to respond for, for, for followers of Jesus and how they ought to respond in, our, in a culture that has lost its moral compass and a culture that has become hostile to biblical principles. And this is new territory for many of us where, for the most part, we've lived in a culture influenced by biblical principles, a culture favorable to Christians living out the faith. But 
that's no longer the case. And we're living in challenging times. Uh, we, we believe that if the church doesn't find its voice and if Christians don't speak to the issues, the culture will continue to digress. We will continue to see increased hostility, uh, increased uh, brokenness. Uh, it, you know, apart from God, my conviction, I think yours is as well, that apart from God and apart from Christians living out the faith, being light, being salt, as Jesus tells the disciples, there's not really a whole lot of hope for culture, is there? I think that uh, God has ordained us to, to be the, uh, the trumpet, and the trumpet sounds forth to battle, and that's our calling. You know, when God called the Apostle Paul, he had Ananias go to him in Damascus, and he said, I want you to tell him that he's a he'd been called to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. That was probably a shock to Paul because he saw himself going to the Jewish people. And then he said, I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer for my name's sake. He didn't say how much he's going to accomplish. He said, it's going to be tough. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to speak for the conference that's coming up. I'm really looking forward to that. I think it's really needed. But, but the preachers and the church leaders need to band together. You know, Ecclesiastes talks about two are better than one, and a strand of three is not easily broken. If a preacher feels like he's the only one standing out there, he's not as likely to speak up. But if we can band together and say, look, this is what we're going to do in the future. We're going to stand courageously and we're going to hold each other's arms up like Aaron and her held up the arms of Moses in battle. Uh, I, 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 in the uh, retreat I just recently uh, performed, I said the preachers of churches in an area need to get together and they need to determine what they're going to do if the government once again tries to shut down the church. And I, I think that we need to say, we're not gonna shut down again. We, we shut down because we thought that we were accommodating. We thought it was a loving thing to do. We were persuaded by the government. We thought it was just gonna be for a few weeks, but that proved to be a failure, both in, in, by the government and by the church. And that we need to, to be proactive and say, we're not gonna shut down again. And then go to the governor and say, look, if, if that decree comes down again, we want you to know together we're going to stand. It's one of the reasons I think we need a conference like this so that we can rally and understand we're not alone. Two are better than one. Yeah, absolutely. And you're going to speak in particular again about pastors uh, speaking to the issues, pastors' role in their community. And uh, I don't want to steal your thunder or give too much away, but uh, pastors do have a, a very important role in their community, maybe even greater than what they think, uh, especially at a time of moral freefall. Again, without that moral reference point, people really are trying to figure out how to think through the issues. People in the church are trying to figure out how to think about the issues and then how to, how to live according to the faith uh, in, in their lives, whether it's in the workplace or in their neighborhoods. They're really, people are looking for, for answers, aren't they? Yeah, and it's a the job of the pastor, there, there are two arms to our mission. One is to evangelize the lost, and the other is to edify the saved and to disciple the people who are in the church. And in recent years, the focus has been so much on trying to reach the seeker that I think we failed to really uh, focus on, at the same time, uh, the, the discipling of our people. And our people are being bombarded with propaganda from the world. And you know, even though it seems so bizarre, if you hear it often enough, you come to believe that it's truth. So when they come to church on Sunday morning, they need to hear a, a, a clear call to truth and be reminded of what God's word says on these matters. I think you can uh, do that without being obnoxious, but our people need uh, training. And they, they, when they, I remember when the Supreme Court uh, passed uh, the gay marriage amendment. And my friend Wayne Smith, who used to preach in Lexington, funny guy, but when he was the preacher, you didn't have to tell him to speak up about cultural issues, man. He, he was, he'd split the pulpit on those, on those issues. 
he was bold and courageous. It didn't matter what it was speaking about uh, uh, alcohol and or, or co-ed dorms or whatever. He would he would speak out. Well, he was retired, and the Supreme Court passed the Gay Marriage Amendment. Uh, the White House was lit up in rainbow colors, and it made him so mad. He went to church expecting to hear the preacher say something uh, about this issue. And nothing was said that morning. Mm. And he left the church angrier than when he went in. Mm. And he called me on Monday and said, I'm so mad I've written a letter to the Lexington Herald leader. And he said, I've got a lot of stuff off your blog. So I've signed both my name and your name to the letter. <laughs> Wayne, I've got enough trouble in Louisville. I don't even know your trouble in Lexington. But uh, uh, Fred Craddock said one time, the preacher doesn't just speak to the church. The preachers sometimes speak for the church. And when people are battling and struggling against uh, Satan's propaganda in the world, when they come to church on Sunday morning, they want reinforcement. They want to they hear from the pulpit, here's what God's word has to say about this subject, so that they can be equipped to, to, to stand strong on the front lines of battle at work on Monday morning. Yeah, very good. It wasn't too long ago where pastors were viewed as a pillar of the community. Some, some still are, I, I suppose. But a place, a, 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 a person to go to if there were big questions, uh, if, if there was a moral issue, social issue, even political issues, people would go to the pastors uh, in their community to, to seek their advice and their counsel. And our hope, uh, Pastor Russell, is that once again, pastors would find their, um, the appropriate role, their rightful role, if you will, in society where they are uh, in tune with God and with his principles and that they're imparting those principles uh, as they teach on Sunday mornings, but then also as they uh, are present and, and active in their community. And uh, I wanna go to something that you, you said I don't know if you want to respond to that. I, there's some, I wanted to add anything to that, but more commentary on, on your thoughts. Um, I, I'll go to the Great Commission. You'd mentioned discipling. So the, this is where we find Jesus, uh, Jesus charges his followers with the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says this, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Does the Great Commission impact beyond our spiritual lives? And the reason I put it that way is it seems there's a dichotomy between our spiritual lives and what we do in the world, our physical lives. Does the Great Commission have an impact in, in the world, in our, let's say, in our jobs or in our neighborhoods or in our politics? You know, Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. And if the salt loses its saltiness, it's not good for anything. You're the light of the world. And you don't light a candle and then put it under the, uh, a basket. It, you put it on the desk so that it gives light to all that can, all who can see. And our, our, our Christian life is not what we do on Sunday or even what we hear from the pulpit, but it's got to permeate every aspect of our life. And uh, we, we want to compartmentalize our, our Christian life and say, okay, Jesus is Lord over this area. Uh, he's Lord over what I do on, in church. He may be Lord over how I discipline my kids. But when I go to the ball game and I get mad at the referee, I somehow have uh, can, can compartmentalize and say, he's not Lord over the language that I use yelling at the referee. Or we want to go to work. And you talk about practicing social dis distancing. We practice spiritual distancing. We, we have these convictions in our heart, but we know how to weave through uh, our workplace or our school and never bring up any issue that is going to make people feel uncomfortable. Because uh, we, we know what those issues are, and we can be casual friends without making anybody feel uncomfortable. Then we go back to church and amen what, the, what we believe about the Great Commission. 
but but the great commission is to impact every facet of our lives and uh, we we are to see people as saved and lost and find some way to get close enough to people that we're able to share the gospel then in the course of time as people are converted to christ we disciple them and teach them a christian worldview that's good and you'd mentioned salt and one of the things that salt does is it preserves and uh it also stems decay both go hand in hand but there's probably a little pain involved when you put a little salt in a wound or you put salt on something uh there's a little pain involved but we're well, becky pipper becky pipper wrote a book years ago called out of the salt shaker and uh, we're content to be salt as long as we don't have to permeate uh, our culture. But it, it, it's, we've got to be circulating and making a difference in every facet of life. Very good. Pastor Bob Russell, it has been a joy talking with you. We look forward to you joining us at the Lexington Conference on April the 29th. And for those of you who'd like to learn more, you can go to the Commonwealth Policy Center website. It's just commonwealthpolicycenter.org. And on the very front page, you'll find more information about that conference and also a sign up there is available as well. Uh, Bob Russell, thank you so much for joining us. God bless you. Well, thank you, Richard. I have a world of respect for you and I really appreciate what you're doing. You be faithful, brother. Thank you.